the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. The Whipping Boy by Sid Fleshman, Part 2. Chapter 13, The Chase. A thoroughbred of the streets, Jimmy acted on instinct. He didn't wait to be nabbed. In a burst of straw, he shot up and made a leap for the door. Cutwater, startled, lost the merest breath of time, but it was enough. Jimmy swung open the door and ran. His long arms outstretched, Cutwater lurched after him, and Prince Brat followed. Jimmy vanished into the wild green tangle. He jumped a great fallen log, ducked under low-hanging branches, and, like a rabbit, made sudden changes in direction. He could hear Cutwater close behind, breathing like a bellows. I'm on your tracks. Stop before I get aggravexed with you, Prince. Jimmy covered the ground at full tilt. Leaves crackled under his feet. Gah, he thought. He might as well be leading a confounded parade for all the noise he was making. He reached a small clearing and half jumped out of his skin. Sniffing near the skeleton white roots of an upturned hollow tree stood a wild beast. A bear. Jimmy would have preferred Cutwater's own company, but before he could find his legs, the hairy beast took flight. It went crashing away to Jimmy's left. Jimmy got his breath back. Then, almost without thinking, he dove into the hollow of a dead tree and snuggled himself in. Moments later, he caught the merest glimpse of Cutwater cupping an ear. Turning on his heels, the rattle-boned man gave a shout. Practically got you by the hind leg, pesky prince. Jimmy let out a small sigh of relief. Cutwater would have a mighty surprise if he caught that bear by the hind leg. As the sounds of the chase grew fainter, Jimmy crawled out of the hollow root. The sun was now high enough to send down smoky rays of light through the treetops. Which way was the river? And then he saw Prince Brat, his face lobster red from running, at the edge of the clearing. Unfaithful servant, he protested, glaring hard at Jimmy. Until this moment, Jimmy hadn't had a moment's pause for anger. But now fury shot into his eyes. Curse this blabber-tongued, hateful prince. You betrayed me, the prince shouted. You'd have deserted me without a care, Jimmy bristled. Ain't it me, they think, is the prince? If you hadn't pointed me out under the straw, Cutwater would have flown off to pick up my tracks, and we could have crept away dead easy. I wouldn't be running my lungs out. The prince pondered this for a moment. Then he nodded. Then I forgive you. Jimmy was speechless for a moment. Forgive me? Don't trouble yourself, my good and loyal prince, and get yourself another whipping boy. But I have not dismissed you from my service, said the prince calmly. I dismiss myself, Jimmy fired back. I'll get where I'm going, and you can find your own way back to the castle. I'll go with you. Not likely. Jimmy turned to the right and beat his way back into the foliage. Chapter 14 In which is heard a voice in the forest. Jimmy could hear Prince Brat following in his tracks step by step. He grimly pressed on. Brambles, reaching out like cat's claws, tore at their fine garments. The forest trees rose all around them like prison bars. Finally, Jimmy spun around. Lay off! Go your own way! This way suits me, said the prince. Well, don't follow me. I have no more idea than a gnat where I'm heading. Silence, whispered the prince, with a turn on his head. Hear that? They froze, the two of them. A voice came wailing through the woods. Petunia, pet pet petunia. And then a young woman appeared, barefoot and jangling with bracelets. She moved through the trees as quickly as a wood spirit. She carried a coiled rope in one hand and held outstretched in the other an amber chunk of comb honey. Come here, darling. Come to Betsy. Suddenly, as if sensing a presence in the trees, she headed toward Jimmy and the prince. Petunia, you there, naughty rascal. Smell the honey. Come feast yourself, pet. Jimmy didn't know what to make of this woman, girl really, for as she drew closer, he reckoned she couldn't be more than fourteen or fifteen years old. He stepped out into full view, with the prince clinging to him like a shadow. Miss? She stopped short. My eyes, who are you? Lost, said Jimmy. Would you know which way to the river? Course I do, 
Ain't we heading for the fair, me and Petunia? Have you seen him? Petunia? Got loose he did, my dancing bear. World famous he is. Scared me out of my skin, Jimmy replied and pointed. Back there. She turned on her heels and started off. Hey, Jimmy shouted, where's the river? Where it's always been, due south. Which way is south? Betsy paused to set her arm like a signpost. Straight on. You certain? Certain I'm certain. Didn't Pa always say I had a head like a compass? Rest him in peace. And she was gone. Chapter 15 Of the Hot Potato Man and Other Matters Following the river, Jimmy ventured toward the city. Prince Brat strode along beside him. Soon as I can, I aim to give you the slip, Jimmy warned. You'll be on your own. The prince said nothing. The tide was low, and they traveled out of sight of the road, below a grassy embankment. In the distance, against billowing white clouds, stood a jackstraw jumble of ship's masts. You can fend for yourself, can't you? Jimmy asked suddenly. Of course I can, answered the prince in a stinging voice. I don't need flocks of servants to fetch and carry for me. It's settled then. Settled. Skip off any time you like. They rounded a bend, and the crack of a whip sounded in the air like a firecracker. Jimmy crawled up the embankment for a look. A weary old coach was mired in a mud hole on the road. The coachman, looking just as old and rickety, held the reins of his two-horse team and cracked his whip in the air again. "'Pull, gents. Be good, lads. It's me own fault not leading you around this bog. Me eyesight ain't what it was, is it, old Tars?' Jimmy watched for another moment as the horses tried to pull the coach free. The coach was enameled blue, with yellow lettering painted on the door panel, Captain Harry Nips, Hot Potato Man. Jimmy crawled over the embankment. A ride to the city would suit him fine. Sir, would you take on a passenger? Here, let me set these barrel staves under the wheels. Don't mind if you do, said Captain Nips. I'm late for the fare as it is. Jimmy busied himself, laying a firm track for the wheels. Prince Brat watched from the edge of the embankment. "'You must be carrying a heavy load,' Jimmy cried out. "'Try again, Cap'n.' The old man cracked his whip. The horses strained, and the coach rolled up out of the bog. "'Hop in, lad!' Jimmy opened the door and saw that the coach was heavily loaded with raw potatoes and a huge iron kettle. Jimmy settled himself as best he could, and the coach lurched forward." At last, Jimmy thought, you're free of the prince, but he couldn't resist a backward glance. Prince Brat was standing in the center of the road. He dropped his load of driftwood and merely gazed at the receding coach. Jimmy straightened and folded his arms. The prince wasn't his lookout any longer, but he'd stood there like a wounded bird. Blast him. Stop, Cap'n, Jimmy shouted. We left my friend behind. The hot potato man pulled up on the reins. Jimmy leaned out a window. With an arm, he motioned Prince Brat to come along. For an instant, Jimmy thought he saw a smile flash across the prince's face, but it had vanished by the time the heir to the throne joined him inside the coach. They rode in silence. Jimmy wondered what had possessed him to refer to Prince Brat as his friend. Friend? Cows would give beer first. Then, minutes later, the coach rocked to a sudden halt. Stand and deliver, came a shout. A pair of highwaymen were training pistols on Captain Nips. Jimmy hardly had to peer out. The voice was too familiar. It was Hold Your Nose Billy and Cutwater. Chapter 16 Wherein the Prince Neither Balls Nor Bellows Jimmy felt a surge of the creeps. Run for it, he wondered. Instead, he began to burrow out of sight under the loose heap of potatoes. Remember, he whispered to the prince, it's me they're after, not you. Tell him we're split up. Tell him I swam the river. Prince Brat merely looked at him. The voices outside boomed, stand and deliver, I said. And I heard you, exclaimed Captain Nips. Deliver what? Potatoes? Scurvy rascals, help yourselves. Hang your potatoes, roared Hold Your Nose Billy. Deliver us some information and you can be off, or after two runaway apprentices. Apprentice highwaymen, Captain Nips scoffed. Our affair, 
girl with a bear said she saw him streaking for the river. You carry in passengers? Jimmy pulled the iron kettle over his head. A coach door was yanked open, and Jimmy could hear Cutwater's muffled cackle. Got one. The whipping boy it is. Where's your master, eh? Jimmy held his breath. He had no reason to believe that the prince wouldn't betray him again. There came a stiff pause, and then Prince Brat said, Swam the river. By then, Hold Your Nose Billy had ripped open the opposite coach door. Even through the kettle, Jimmy imagined he could smell the garlic. Swam the river, faw, he'd need scales and fins. Hardly a moment later, the kettle was grabbed off and Jimmy's head stood exposed. Here's the potato we're after, Hold Your Nose Billy roared gleefully. Jimmy and the prince were yanked out of the coach, and the big outlaw shouted to Captain Nips, Throw me down your horsewhip and drive on. Hanging on to each boy by the scruff of the neck, the highwayman scrambled out of sight below the embankment. Hold Your Nose Billy looked angry enough to throttle Jimmy on the spot. Tricked me, did you? he bellowed. Flummoxed me with your fancy quill scratching. The game's up, Jimmy thought. He's figured that the ransom note ain't good for nothing. But trying to look as innocent as possible, he replied, Sir? A gold sack or two would have satisfied me in Cutwater, snarled the hairy outlaw. Greedy ain't our middle name, but you, raising the ante to a great cartload, reckoned to slow us down, didn't you? It would be easier to drag around a dead horse. If we ain't light-footed, we're caught. That was your scheme. What a pair of fools, Jimmy thought. That hadn't been his scheme at all. You've got it all wrong, he declared. I swear it. Aye, enough plunder to burden us directly to the gallows, eh? Hold your nose, Billy continued. Well, here's a whipping you won't never forget. He snapped Captain Nip's whip into the air and got the feel of it. Here's the whipping boy, Cutwater put in. You said it'll go powerful worse for us if we thrash the prince himself. Hold your nose, Billy nodded sharply. Cutwater upturned the prince, holding him by the ankles in the air. Go to it, Billy. Jimmy finally found his voice. Lay down the whip, he commanded with a princely air. Don't you have an ounce of sense between you? Hold your gab. Simpletons, you can just fill your pockets with plunder and be light-footed as ever, Jimmy declared. Nobody flummoxes hold your nose, Billy, and gets away with it. The whip snapped across the prince's back. Jimmy held his breath. He knew what it felt like. He saw that Prince Brat had set his jaws, just as Jimmy had always done, and not a sound escaped his lips. Harder, Cutwater advised. You didn't raise a peep out of him. The big man let fly again. He must have a hide like an elephant, cried Cutwater. He don't feel a thing. He'll feel this, Hold Your Nose Billy thundered, and the leather whistled through the air. The prince's jacket was being shredded. Ball out, Jimmy shouted. He dreamed of seeing the prince whipped, but now that it was actually happening, he found no satisfaction in it. Holler and cry out. I won't tell anyone. But Prince Brat only girded himself for the next blow. From the top of the embankment came an outraged voice. Betsy and her dancing bear stood there. Ruffian, she cried out. What are you doing to that poor boy? No business of yours, snarled Cutwater. Stop it. But Hold Your Nose Billy raised the whip again. The next thing Jimmy knew, the girl had slipped the rope from around the bear's neck. Sick him, Petunia. Go get him. Chapter 17. Petunia to the Rescue The bear came snarling down the embankment. Rising on its hind legs, it bared its teeth and bellowed out a thunderclap of a roar. Cutwater dropped the prince and was off like a greyhound. Hold your nose, Billy, his eyes round as snowballs, went charging off into the river. He raised a great splash, and if he didn't know how to swim, he learned. Instantly. Jimmy had reared back, but now Betsy gave a whistle and the bear stopped in its tracks. Good boy, Petunia. That'll do, darling. She slipped the rope back around the bear's neck. Then she bent over the prince. The low-down bullies, laying stripes on a boy's back. With the bear sniffing him, Prince Brat didn't move a muscle. Rain in your beast, he whispered stiffly. Oh, don't be afraid of Petunia, gentle as a kitten he is. Ain't you the brave one? 
must sting something dreadful. Jimmy watched the prince slowly raise himself off the mudflat. He felt a growing amazement. Prince Brat, a brave one, it didn't seem possible. But gaw, there was a cast iron streak of pluck in him. The prince moved his arms and shoulders. He winced, but then began to brush himself off. Steady on your legs? Jimmy asked. Steady. You should have yelled and bellowed. That's what they wanted to hear. And humble myself? muttered the prince. You never did. Jimmy gazed at him for a thoughtful moment. Then he indicated the two highwaymen. Cutwater had vanished, and Hold Your Nose Billy was trying to keep from drowning. Let's be on our way. They're sure to be back after us. Not if you travel with me, said Betsy, me and Petunia. Jimmy found the horsewhip where Hold Your Nose Billy had dropped it. Betsy and the bear had already started up the embankment, and the boys followed. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit. They travel on with Betsy and Captain Nips, and then they're all sitting eating potatoes in town. And that's where we're going to pick it up. Chapter 18 of Assorted Events in Which the Plot Thickens Thicker Captain Nips began calling out to the passing crowd as they ate. Potatoes! Hot, hot potatoes! Captain Nips! Hot, hot potatoes! Jimmy gorged himself, anxious to be off and not certain when he would eat again. A ballad seller was working his way through the crowd, crying out his wares. He waved a bamboo pole with long paper streamers fluttering from the tip. Three yards of songs a copper, old songs, new songs, sing them yourself. Ten verses of poor pitiful Polly will make you weep. Sixteen verses of that notable highwayman, hold your nose, Billy. Jimmy's ears pricked up as the ballad seller began singing a sample of his merchandise. Hold your nose, Billy, a wild man is he. Hang him from a gallows tree. Here he comes, there he goes. Don't forget to hold your nose. The street song had once amused Jimmy, but now he only sharpened his eyes. He wiped his hands on his sleeves and turned to Captain Nips. Thanks for the grub, sir. Where are you off to? asked Betsy. Here's the place to put a jingle in your pockets. Can't you turn cartwheels or something? I catch rats, Jimmy said simply. Rats? Betsy made a face. What on earth for? There's good money in sewer rats. The meaner, the better. My eyes, exclaimed Betsy. Don't you get bit? Many a time, said Jimmy. Captain Nips cocked an ear. What's that running patterer yelling about? A crow-like voice pierced the air, and then the news seller appeared, his tongue wagging like a bell clapper, a bundle of broadsides under his arm. Prince sold to gypsies, the true and genuine facts, ink still wet, whipping boy charged with dastardly scheme, king offers reward for the unspeakable rascal, dead or alive, full description, get your copy, keep your eyes peeled and catch the reward. He was selling his broadsides almost as fast as he could yell. The facts were cockeyed, but Jimmy grabbed his birdcage, backed off, and was gone. Chapter 19, being a full account of the happenings in the dark sewers. Jimmy headed for the only safe place he knew, the sewers. He scrambled along the docks, and the prince dogged him every step of the way. Jimmy turned on him like a cornered rat. Ain't you done enough? You've got a price put on my head. Go home. But you're my friend, the prince stated, as if he were issuing a royal decree. Don't count on it, replied Jimmy. He started down stone steps to the river, but the prince stopped him with a sudden urgent yelp. Look! Looming up on the cobbled wayside came the hulk of Hold Your Nose Billy, with Cutwater following as close as a cow's tail. Jimmy didn't wait to be spotted, but it was too late. The big outlaw, his hair and beard looking bonfire red under the bright sun, gave a distant yell and altered course. Jimmy and the prince took the stairs in leaps. The tide was coming in, and the mud flat had shrunk to the width of a path. 
Jimmy led the way through a tarred forest of wharf pilings and over a derelict river barge. He leaped off into shallow water. He could already see the great brick mouth of a main sewer. Don't leave footprints in the mud, he warned. They splashed along the water's edge and were there. The arched sewer stood tall enough for a horse and rider. Jimmy leaped the mud and was in. But the prince balked. It's black as night in there. Jump, quick! The prince steeled himself and made the leap. Jimmy advanced into the tunnel, but the prince held back. Follow me. We'll be lucky if they didn't catch sight of us. The prince stood terrified of the darkness ahead. He had turned dead white. Jimmy made a grab and yanked the prince after him. You'll get me caught. I'm... I'm scared, Jimmy. Don't fret about the dark. There are rats in here. Even grown men are scared of him. Hang on to me. Deeper and deeper, darker and darker, they sloshed through the cavernous sewer. The gutters of the city overhead had dried, but old rain seeped and dripped from the glazed brick walls. Soon the mouth had receded to little more than a pinhole of light, and Jimmy stopped to catch his breath. Blacker and a stack of black cats in here, ain't it? We should come to another passage before long. They'll never find us. Ease off my arm, would you? You'll break it. Jimmy... Hardly above a breath, the prince's voice was stiff with fear. Jimmy? Not Jimmy from the streets. Not boy. The wonder of it, Jimmy thought. Like we was old knockabout friends of the streets. I... I wish I were like you. Jimmy was amazed. Like me? You're not afraid of anything. Course I am. I'm afraid your pa'll hang me. Not likely. Jimmy gave a small snort. Not likely unless you give away my hiding place down here. Do you think I'd do that, Jimmy? I don't know. Let's keep moving. As they edged along the wet walls, Jimmy gave his reply a second thought. He'd wronged the prince. This wasn't the same prince brat who'd run away the night before, bored with his own meanness and haughtiness and cruelty. Reckon I do trust you, said Jimmy. And the prince replied, I won't go back to the castle unless you go with me. Gaw. The main sewer branched off, and Jimmy had to stop to get his bearings. Careful, he thought. That passage to the left leads to the brewery. You could get eaten alive. Keep to the right branch. In the hollowness of the sewer there came a soft scurrying of feet, and then a distinct squeaking sound. The prince's fingers locked on Jimmy's arm like a manacle. Nothing but a rat, Jimmy said. Two of them, but nothing to worry about yet. Dark ain't so bad if you know what's in it, like off to the left. So hang on to me. The prince's voice was almost inaudible. What's to the left? A brewery overhead. They empty their used-up grain down the sewer, and the rats feed and breed by the hundreds. Grow big as street cats, and short-tempered, they'll swarm all over you and hang on by their teeth. Still clinging to his birdcage, Jimmy continued feeling his way along. He wondered how he'd ever felt at home in these dank, smelly sewers. Then a sudden flicker of light from a side passage stopped him. He peered down the tunnel and saw a figure with a candle fixed to the stiff bill of his cap. A rat catcher. He could see a cage full of squealing rats. He entered the passage and the man looked up. Who goes there? Didn't mean to give you a scare, Jimmy whispered. This is no place for boys. The man's full voice boomed and echoed through the sewers, and Jimmy took a quick look behind. Hold it down, sir, he said softly, and then he thought he recognized the rat catcher. Ain't you old Johnny Tosher? With the candle glowing from his hat bill, the man bent forward. I declare, is that you, Jimmy? It is. Ain't you grown since you left the sewers? I'd be obliged if you'd snuff out your candle, sir. There's bloodthirsty ruffians after us. Speak up, said the old man, cupping a hand over his ear. Is it true you've got taken up by the king himself? That's the gossip. What are you doing back in the sewers? Running for our lives. Eh? Your candle will give us away. What's that? You do us a kindness to pinch it out. Speak up, lad. Now you're a king's little gentleman. They learn you to talk in whispers? Come back for a visit, have you? Oh, your pod be proud. He gave the top of Jimmy's head a pat. They say you're Prince Brat's own whipping boy. Suddenly the rat catcher straightened. 
Who's there? Looming up in the yellow glow stood an immense hairy figure and a rattle-boned man. Jimmy's heart stopped cold. What in blazes? roared Hold Your Nose Billy. They flummoxed us, Cutwater. That one ain't the prince. It's the other. I heard, Cutwater cried out. We whipped the prince himself. Worse than common murder, you said. Aye, the king will skin us alive by inches. Mercy on us. But not if he don't find out. Both lurched forward to grab the boys. Jimmy swung the birdcage, knocking the candle flying. The flames sputtered out in the murky water, and the sewer was thrown into sudden darkness. Run for it, Jimmy yelled out. I got one, cackled Cutwater. That's me you got, bellowed the rat catcher. Scurvy riffraff, who are you? Jimmy flattened himself against the wall and found the prince already there. He heard a splash and a curse as Hold Your Nose Billy must have tumbled over Cutwater and the rat catcher. In an urgent whisper, the prince asked, Which way? Jimmy made an instant decision. Back to the main sewer. He gave the prince's sleeve a quick tug, and the prince reached out for Jimmy's hand. Off they went, linked together, while the outlaws untangled themselves. Which way did they go? cried out Cutwater. Listen for him. Jimmy froze. He didn't breathe. He waited, and he became suddenly aware of the prince's hand clasped in his own. His first impulse was to withdraw his fingers, but the prince was hanging on for dear life. It was the same as a handshake and he remembered the prince's own words. It felt friendly, trusting. But gah, the wonder of it, shaking hands with Prince Brad. Stop where you stand, warned Hold Your Nose Billy. Wherever you are, we'll catch you, added Cutwater. You'll never make it out. Which way is out, snapped the big outlaw. The same way you came in, answered the rat catcher. Put your back to the breeze from the main sewer. That was wrong. Good old Tosher, Jimmy thought. He meant to send them off in the wrong direction. Jimmy tugged on the prince's hand, and they scuttled along the wall toward freedom. A moment later, Jimmy could feel a stronger breeze, and he knew they were in the main sewer again. Noses to the breeze, they could make a run for the river. But in his sudden elation, Jimmy banged into the wall with the birdcage. His hair rose. The clatter was loud enough to wake the dead, or bring the villains running. Jimmy made an abrupt turn, pulling the prince deeper into the main sewer, and he whispered, They'll see us against the daylight before we can get out. More holes than wormwood down here. We'll duck into another side tunnel. But if we break loose, don't lose your bearings. The brewery's dead ahead. The sound of feet sloshing through the water silenced them. Jimmy felt desperately for the mouth of a side tunnel, but Hold Your Nose Billy and Cutwater had already rushed into the main sewer. "'Which way, Billy?' muttered Cutwater. Jimmy flattened himself against the grave-cold wall, but the prince seemed suddenly to rebel at being chased down like a sewer rat. He yanked the birdcage out of Jimmy's hand and flung it with all his might. It banged and clattered off the bricks in the direction of the brewery. "'What's that?' cried out Cutwater. "'Them is what?' Put your back to the breeze, straight on. They barged ahead. Only moments later, old Tosher appeared across the great sewer, a fresh candle lit on the bill of his cap. And then Hold Your Nose Billy and Cutwater came flying back. I'm bit, I'm bit. Help! Grain-fed rats were swarming over the two of them, nipping and biting and clinging like leeches. In the light of the candle, Cutwater waved his arms wildly. He screeched and the hairy outlaw bellowed. I declare, said the prince, they look like they're wearing fur coats. Chapter 20, in which the sun shines and we learn what befell the whipping boy, the prince, and everyone else. Standing in the clear sunshine, the prince breathed the sweet, fresh air. Then he looked Jimmy squarely in the eyes. We're going back to the castle. Not me. Your paws put a price on this hat of mine, No, thank you, Prince. I don't fancy doing a jig from the end of a rope. Where will you hide for the rest of your life? In the sewers? I'd have them searched end to end. Gah, what a fool he'd been to let the Prince in on his best hiding place. Jimmy was on the verge of running, but where to? How far would he get? You said you trusted me, declared the Prince. 
but I can see you didn't mean it. I meant it, up to a point. Then follow me. It was a command. Jimmy swallowed hard and followed. They weren't at the castle gates yet. He'd think of something. The prince led him back under the fairgrounds and searched out Betsy and the hot potato man. You've served your prince nobly, he announced. What be you talking about, lad? replied Captain Nips. Hot, hot potatoes. The king has offered a reward for the whipping boy. Here he stands. Turn him in. And Jimmy stood dumbfounded. He felt betrayed. Gah! Betsy flashed her eyes. Turn Jimmy in? I'll do no such thing. I command it. Who are you to command anything? I'm... I'm Prince Brad. Ha! scoffed Betsy. Run for it, Jimmy thought. Deeply wounded, he gave the prince a last blazing look. The prince returned a quick playful wink. It befuddled Jimmy for an instant. And then, in a flash, Jimmy saw that for the first time, the prince was up to a kindly piece of mischief. Head to toe, he's Prince Brat, said Jimmy. Better do what he says or I'll have you boiled in oil. Jimmy had to wait with Betsy, Petunia, and Captain Nips while the prince was alone with the king. Finally, a pair of golden doors were opened, and the group was ushered into the throne room. The king sat with his legs crossed, and the merest flicker of a smile on his lips. Betsy bowed low, and Captain Nips did the best he could. "'The reward is yours,' the king announced. And then he turned to the prince. "'What about the bear? Came to your rescue, did he?' "'Couldn't we give him the title of Official Dancing Bear to Your Royal Majesty, Papa? He'd draw crowds wherever he went.' Done. Betsy and Captain Nips were dismissed. Jimmy now stood alone, it seemed hours, while the king gazed at him. He began to feel a noose tightening around his neck. You ought to be whipped. Yes, my lord. Prince Horus has caused enough mischief to wear out the hides of a dozen whipping boys. He tells me it's thanks to you that he's back, sound and safe. The king thanks you. Jimmy took a small breath. You are placed under the prince's protection under one condition. He has sworn to do his lessons, blow out his night candle, and otherwise behave himself. Jimmy's eyes flicked to the prince. Gah, he thought. You must want me for a friend awful bad to promise all that. So help me, if it's a friend you ran off looking for, it's a friend you found. Dismissed, both of you, said the king. But do change out of those smelly clothes. Retreating toward the golden doors, the prince beside him, Jimmy felt a sparkle rise into his eyes. "'You got me off without so much as a single whack,' he whispered. "'I couldn't bear all the yowling and bellowing. "'I wouldn't yowl and bellow. "'But I would, Jimmy.' And Jimmy caught the twinkle in his eyes. Almost at the doors, they were stopped by the king's voice. "'One more thing.' The king broke into a smile you could warm your hands over. If you boys decide to run away again, take me with you. In the days that followed, ballad sellers began to cry out new and final verses to the notorious life of Hold Your Nose Billy and his partner Cutwater. An old rat catcher had seen them flee from the sewer, and he'd seen them stow away aboard a ship, raising its sails for a long voyage. It was a convict ship, bound for a speck of an island in distant waters. A convict island. The End of The Whipping Boy by Sid Fleshman For those who requested part two, I hope you enjoyed it. And to one and all, Godspeed.